desired to be and for whom things really are as the understanding or science describes them and only apparently are as individual perception construes them. Ironically, I think for Hegel such a scientific realism would sound rather too indebted to the Aristotelian essence-accident distinction that he thinks reflective thought has moved beyond. But I'll leave that part of the story out. Salazian scientific realism has it that while the appearances of the manifest world are constrained by contextual features conditioning perception, I mean, you know, that's all those epistemic conditions, science is at least capable of aspiring to a type of view from nowhere. But for Hegel, the categories within which the understanding works are as equally contextual, they're the categories of, sort of this dialectical interaction between individuals, they're as equally contextual as those within, with, within which perception works. They're just different sorts of contexts. They are the categories appropriate for the context, sorry, so the, the categories of science, the understanding of the categories appropriate for the context within which disputes are resolved contestatively. Hegel I take to be a type of epistemic contextualist such, such that we cannot appeal to some idea about the way an object really or essentially is independently of any context of cognitive engagement with it in order to explain how it merely appears to be within some specific epistemic context. This much I think Hegel has in common with Kant's critique of traditional metaphysics. But Hegel also rejects Kant's metaphysical quietism. Thus, if we want to say anything concerning how objects essentially or really are, as Hegel thinks we must, we must say something like that they are both objects of perception and objects of the understanding, not that they are really one of these and only apparently the other. But these conceptions of objectshood like the array of conceptions of objecthood that we get in the phenomenology of spirit are incompatible. So if we want to speak from a type of view from nowhere, we have to say things like things are, in truth and in essence, contradictory. Thank you. So if you have a question, a new question, raise a hand and get on the list. If you, to, if, you can, uh, if you want to make a small point about the, the point currently under discussion, raise a finger and you can then jump the queue if the list isn't too long. Koji, you're first. Anyone else who wants to ask a question, please keep your hand up. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just wondered whether I could um, draw some consequences of, of, of the view that um, you are uh, kind of advocating. So, so kind of your, your freedom and your logic. And um, well, one thing that I think you have to deal with uh, in talking about the media logic is basically Russell's paradox, especially the kind of thing that we are talking about. Um, so, so, so the logic of dealing with the object of perception at the same time the object of understanding or something like that. Um, because Russell's paradox is supposed to show that the link should be broken down. And so, so Russell thought that we have to go to the extensional, as opposed to the intentional with this. And, and, but uh, Hegel seems to be basically making that link. And so, so looks to me that you have to deal with Russell's paradox. But I, th I think um, one thing you can say is that I think this is, the, this is what Frege uh, had in mind as well, except that he couldn't resolve the contradiction in the end. Is that, I mean, Frege seems to be take, thinking of logic from a kind of epistemic perspective. He, did, he didn't really advocate any ontology, so to speak. So he was talking about logic as uh, dealing with the epistemic conditions, which has some grip on the object. Where the op uh, and he wasn't really prepared to say anything in the ontological. He wasn't prepared to give any ontological status to the, to the object. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't really dealing with the link between extension and intention in the way that Russell thought of. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that I mean, he couldn't resolve the contradiction, even if he thought of logic from a kind of epistemic perspective. But I think from a Hegelian perspective, 
uh, who can accommodate a contradiction in a certain way, in a way that diarists like myself and can accommodate. Um, that seems to have a kind of, um, 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 from that perspective, you can respond to Russell's paradox. And we kind of basically say, oh, Frege got it right, just that he was reasonably dogmatic about global you know, contradiction. So I just wonder what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's sort of a lot of bits of that question. I don't know if I can sort of say anything um, about all of them. Um, but I think, I mean, to me, the idea that there's a type of continuity um, that goes uh, within this, the, these different periods of uh, philosophy such that the Kantian antinomies are not all that different to you know, the sort of set theoretical paradoxes and that that sort of come up later. Um, seems, seems to me to be right. Um, uh, that's not doing anything like suggesting that Hegel's got you know, a solution to it or anything like that. Right? But it seems to me that uh, it's in the same sort of ballpark about considerations uh, of that nature. Kant was all, already aware of, I think, uh, in his own sort of informal way, that uh, the logical structure of that type of paradox. Right? Um, it's just that, you know, effectively because of Russell, everyone has forgotten about the 19th century and about how much logic people actually knew. Yeah. Um, on the issue of whether or not um, <coughs> pe who gets, who sort of does their logic and gets their ontology out of their logical, or, or does their logic and has no ontological commitments, or has a, an ontology and then shapes their logic to it. And it seems to me Aristotle's the third position, right? I mean, he has an ontology and he thinks of the structure of thought as somehow fitting in with that. Um, Kant has the idea that you get your ontology out of your logic, but it's a sort of the, the ontology of the apparent world, and then he doesn't say anything <coughs> about the, as well, what everyone wants to know about what's behind the apparent world. Um, and it's just very difficult to describe what Hegel's, what game Hegel's playing there, it seems to me. It, it seems to me that he wants to, um, on the one hand, avoid Kant's sort of quietest position of saying, there's something that we can't talk about. Um, and he wants to re-establish a type of connection with metaphysics as it's been traditionally done. Um, and in some ways, like Frey, well, some, some people think right. he gets a sort of an ontology out of it, but it's not an ontology in the yeah. tradition that we would think of as the sort of project of Aristotle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, th I think Russell's paradox is supposed to show that um, uh, something like Aristotelian project is untenable because that gets ontology in a very strict sense of the term, whereas Frege and Kruzum and Hegel takes the ontology to mean a different way. Mm -hmm. so, so that's can be a response to Russell's paradox. Yeah. And so, so, so then that view of logic isn't being coherent and is shown by Russell, but it's right. not. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, Russell just damns all the idealists yeah. by assuming that they don't know any logic other than Aristotelian yeah. syllogisms, yeah. Uh, which seems to be just wrong. Um, in, uh, uh, you know, a lot of recent work on Kant, for example, uh, Mary Tiles has got sort of a nice account which she sort of says that really what you find in Kant is a sort of a set of design sketches for the sort of, you know, for, for modern logic that comes out of Frege. So we've done a different terminology and without the sort of elegance <laughs> and so on and, and without anything like formal logic, but you know, the concepts are there. And I think Hegel right. comes from that tradition. Right. Well, well I, I very much appreciate your uh, account of how to get from Aristotle to Hegel, and particularly where you've lined up uh, the transition from a term logic to a propositional logic with uh, a very interesting account of the relation between perception and fully blown conceptual uh, activity. I think that's very interesting. But, but I do want to claim that uh, your early right turn made most of that irrelevant to a criticism of uh, my claim with which you, with which you began, uh, the claim that uh, far from denying the principle of non-contradiction, Hegel radicalizes it and puts it at the center uh, uh, of his thought. I mean, on my picture, he starts off with the notion of um, 